Okay, this is Dale. Um, I have been with the uh, community in Mount Biamp uh, going on six years. Uh, I, before that, I did uh, at my own contracting business. I did sound systems, mainly in houses of worship. I, I ran that company for 25 years, so I've been around a few times. Um, designing a sound system for a house of worship. There are four questions we need to answer. Number one, is it loud enough? Number two, can everybody hear? Number three, can everybody understand? And number four, will it feed back? So let's get started. Question one, is it loud enough? First thing we need to do is, is talk a little bit about how we actually measure SPL. Um, Professional sound level meters can measure peak and continuous and, and impulse noises and all kinds of things. But the, the typical sound level meter that you would have got at Radio Shack in the years by or, or, or other places now, the less than $100, will we'll measure the continuous, the RMS level. Um, so in speech, there's a lot of spaces in between. This is a, a phrase, and I didn't have the audio recording, I didn't uh, attach that to my, my slideshow, but the phrase modern electroacoustics began in 1915. Uh, that has a, a crest factor, in other words, the, the height of the peak compared to the continuous level. If you were to average this out, the, the continuous level is quite low. There's a lot of spaces in between these words, even though the peaks reach uh, full scale on the, on the negative uh, half, uh, 12 to 15, 12 to 16 dB of crest factor. Pink noise, continuous noise, what we use when we measure and rate loudspeakers has a 6 dB crest factor, or we might even, in certain cases, use sine waves with uh, 3 dB crest factor. So when we go to measure uh, what the speaker's capable of. We'll use a, a very dense signal like this and we'll get a high number when we actually measure what the speaker is doing in the field with speech or program. We'll get much lower number because we're a lot more higher crest factor and space in between. <clears throat> so we want the measured speech level to be 15 dB, a minimum of 15 dB above the noise level. Ideally, perfect world, it should be 25 dB or, or higher. Uh, the noise is continuous and the speech is, of course, those momentary bursts that make up speech. Uh, measuring a speech level in a normal conversation, you know, a couple of people sitting around in their living room, it's going to be 65 to 70 dB uh, speech level. And that's that's a fine for a reinforcement, you know, a speech level in a room of quiet, attentive people, a church, quiet church service. Uh, 84 dB is a more, more realistic number for a noisy crowd. Say you're at an auction or a, a game, uh, there's a lot of noise going on, people moving around and talking over. Uh, we want much higher speech level. If we add the crest factor to the speech level, so we got 84 dB speech level, and that has a let's just say 12 dB crest factor, we get 96 is what we should be looking for as a target SPL um, from the loudspeaker. If we were to run the loudspeaker at full, you know, full power with a, sign, with a, with a continuous pink noise or something like that. Uh, so the, the point being, we're not, you're not going to measure 96 dB in the stands at a football game. Um, high school football, you know, typical thing. You're you're going to measure the speech as a you know 84. That's that the crest factor makes a difference in that. But we we use the 96 as a target level for for how we how we manipulate the the, the loudspeaker's level to to how it arrives at the audience's ears. So a quiet traditional church can obviously be much lower. A high energy contemporary worship can be higher than that. So, once we know the 
the level that we want at the audience ears, we can work back to how much level has to come out of the, the loudspeaker. And this is a simple inverse square law. You should all be more or less familiar with it. 6 dB of, I want to say dispersion, the sound is spread over a larger area. So every time you double the distance, we get 6 dB of, of level drop. So we can take our distance, you know, how far away the speaker is from the ears and work back, you know, how many more dB do we need coming out of the speaker, you know, to take care of the, the level drop with distance. Or you can just try the loudspeaker in a computer room model and see what the result says. You can do this, all these computer modeling things you could do with pencil and paper if you had all week to get an answer that the computer can give you in you know a couple minutes. <clears throat> Question two, can everybody hear? Even room coverage is the most single most important design consideration. It's also often the most overlooked. It's in some cases the least understood by people who haven't taken the time to sit down and study how does the sound uh, propagate in the room, you know, someone's closer but off axis, someone's further but on axis, you know, how, how does this all work? Uh, the direct sound coverage mapping programs are free. We prefer to use Ease Focus 3. Um, in this case, we're paying license uh, for each speaker model that we register in Ease Focus, and that's how the software developers get their money they give you the program for free. So we're paying we're paying the freight on this one and, and, and you get to pick it up uh, for free. None of the programs will tell you where to put the loudspeaker. They will only tell you what happens if you put it there. And that's always been the, the power of the computer is to quickly answer what if. What if I do this? What if I do that? Um, by trying a few things, you pretty soon get to see what's a good idea, what's a bad idea, why um, something you thought might have been a good idea might not be. And so you can, what if What if I move it front two feet or back two feet? What if I move it up two feet? How does, it, how does this change it? And, and you, you, you end up training yourself a little bit how, how loudspeaker propagation works. And pretty soon you're getting to the, the right answer much quicker because you've you understand what does and doesn't work. So how good is good enough? What is a critical, uh, for critical and active listening, I like to go for plus minus two dB at four kilohertz over 95% of the seats. And that's, people have different criteria they like for that, but that's, that's what I've used for many years, been successful for me. And then plus or minus three dB over 100% of the seats. Uh, only 5% of the seats will drop either below or above uh, that target level. For sports announcements, paging, you know, plus minus three or even looser uh, design criteria may be adequate for, you know, paging in a, in a, in a warehouse or a factory, a 10 dB window, you know, plus or minus five would probably be uh, quite acceptable. <clears throat> Other frequencies, four kilohertz must be right. If basically, if if four kilohertz isn't right, then you need to keep working until it is. One and two, two and two kilohertz and one kilohertz should also be very even, and that's largely dependent on how much, how constant the directivity of the loudspeaker is. If the if the speaker's uh, balloon polar patterns are pretty much the same at one kilohertz, two kilohertz, and four kilohertz, then you get four right, one and two are taken care of as well. Good coverage at high frequencies adds sheen and presence. It's not critical for intelligibility. It's nice for music. Uh, lower frequencies are more difficult. They require larger devices. Longer wavelengths equals larger devices to control the sound. Um, one of my little mottos is go for even coverage to as low a frequency as budget and aesthetics allow. If 
you can afford a little bit bigger speaker and it's not going to make complaints so then you can get uh, directivity to a lower frequency which speaker to use this is something that's often not talked about in the literature but each loudspeaker kind of has a preferred tilt angle or at least a range um, where it will cover the largest audience area evenly left here i have a, a 60 degree vertical speaker i have the the uh, polar uh, pattern here masked off to plus and minus 2 db that's the range where any seat within that green area will be uh, within our, our window for, for coverage criteria. So this black line represents a, a, the seating area on the floor. And as you can see, we can draw that line. Um, that's We're looking for the longest line we can draw that stays within that green area, but without going such that the, the speaker's aimed up the wall. Obviously, we don't want to keep confined it as much as possible to the yeah. so this 60 degree vertical wants to tilt down fairly steep that's a 25 or 30 degree angle it's tilting down uh, at the bottom we have a 15 degree vertical speaker this is an Entesis uh, 200 series and you see at a at a shallow angle here we get a much long a nice long line here that we can cover evenly at at uh, at a shallow angle so that's you know, what 10 degrees or something five ten degrees uh so it it wants a you know the, the vertical angle of the speaker will determine what is tilt you know what's what is useful for tilting um obviously the 60 degree speaker we could tilt it much further down we'd get a line across here it might be useful in some applications it's but it's it's uh when you first first encounter a new speaker, when you, you want to look at its vertical and and look at a, a at a pattern like this and see what does it really want to do? What what's it uh, what's its preference for tilt angle? Horizontal dispersion angles generally the wider the dispersion, the more flare, floor area you can cover uh, better than with not narrow angles. Uh, here we have the same speaker. Um, I should say should, the same the same room setup, the same speaker height, the same uh, tilt angle, and so forth. But the top is a 60 degree horizontal. The bottom is a 120 degree horizontal version. The same speaker, both both 60 vertical. So the the wide wide vertical by narrow horizontal will cover much more of the floor you know here we got a little bit above and a little bit below but it's not like this one got a huge hot spot in the middle and not reaching the, the corners <clears throat> where to locate the speaker well in front of the listeners obviously we hear sound directionality much more keenly horizontally because of our ears on the sides of our head and, and less keenly vertical so having the speaker located vertically above the person talking is much more natural sounds much more like the speaker the sound is coming from that person um, uh, locate the speaker where there are suitable rig points building attachment provisions obviously we can't hang it uh, when there's nothing to attach it to Beware of visual sightline issues, video screens, stained glass, other visual elements. Regardless how well you think it might work, don't put your speaker directly in front of the face of Jesus on the stained glass window. It will not face good acceptance with the customer that way. Aim the speaker at or near the furthest seat it is intended to cover. Um, this is that same pattern as a 60 degree vertical uh, speaker. And it's very easy to get good coverage in the rear half of the room. Um, the front is where you got some issues. You may have to, to work. Maybe this seating area is a little bit longer out the front here. How are we going to cover that? So if the front's uh, too loud 
or you know third of the way back is where the the hot spot typically is um, if that's too loud you can raise the speaker higher and tilt it steeper but don't forget about the roof it's it's easy to get very even coverage just put the speaker way way up there and point it straight down but we can't do that uh, or use a smaller vertical angle speaker tighter tighter vertical pattern will get this hot spot quite as much if the front is too quiet lower the speaker uh, and use a shallow tilt angle again beware of sight lines you know you don't can't drop in front of a video screen or something like that use a larger vertical angle speaker if the front's too quiet if you've got that narrow speaker here just lighting up the back and not reaching the front get a, a broader vertical using fill speakers well first try a little bit harder to get good coverage from the main speaker it's always best use a single source if possible when it's not typically the front of the room uh, front corners of a rectangular room will need a fill here we're seeing a little diagram main speaker here covers the floor main part of the auditorium very well but it's missing this little area in the both sides in the front so we'll add a fill speaker now where to put it if we put the fill speaker here we can fill that area real nice but we're also aiming it out into the middle of the room and here we're going to have some delay late arrival problems we'll need to delay this speaker to match the main and then it comes back itself delayed and further away and can cause issues uh, for the rest of the seating so we want to try and keep sound going in the same direction whenever speakers are pointed toward each other uh, that's typically an indication there may be problems we need to look at arrival times not just coverage so we put the speaker here we can cover this triangle just as well from this this side um, but now the sound is kind of coming from a, a virtual location point here going kind of moving out from that point um, keep sound going the same direction is generally better uh, for use of fills if possible reduce the throw distance from the fill speaker to the filled area um, depends again how, how big that area is uh, if it's just a few seats and you can have a small speaker very close it will run at lower level and it will have less detrimental effects in other areas only fill the frequencies needed the main speaker will have enough low frequency spill you only need to add mids and highs let me go back here so this is a pattern you know the high frequency pattern of this horn but at low frequencies it's pretty much omnidirectional so what's going out in low frequencies over here is the same as what's coming out into the seating so we don't need to add extra low frequency we'll only add the mids and highs and bring them at least close in time maybe not exact obviously for different seats going to change but if if this speaker is filling a thousand hertz spilling into that area good then the fill speaker might only run from a thousand up um, just just to add the frequencies that are missing um, fill only the frequencies needed i said that delay the fill uh, even if it's right next to the main speaker we don't want a transition the transition area where the levels are the same we want to intentionally misalign them by a couple wavelengths um, so that the comb filter nulls are narrow in frequency and small in, in physical area if we align it perfectly at one spot as soon as you move off of that spot you've got a large area uh, of, of a wide comb filter notch a first order notch uh, that will be more destructive than intentionally misaligning question three can everybody understand <clears throat> Speech intelligibility is predicted, not measured, predicted by STI, Speech Transmission Index, which is in turn calculated from modulation transfer function. Modulation is when a signal is turned on and off. This, picture this as an AM radio where this is a carrier frequency is turned on and off. 
in this case, it's it's speeches, it's speech, but the tones of speech are turned on and off by our, our tongues and lip, what, what, what creates the formants of speech. So this word right here is modern. Modern, there's the D where you, you close your, close the air off, modern. So when you add noise, you fill in that gap, you don't hear that D is not near as distinct. And again, I should have had audio clips, but this is modern. When you add reverberation in a room, it's gonna come out sounding like marm. You're not gonna hear that tight cutoff for the D. So that's reduced modulation. We can't transfer the, 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 the communication channel, the speaker acoustics in room, can't transfer that deep modulation. <clears throat> so noise and reverberation. Noise, of course, would be a continuous low level of mask how deep these notches can go. Um, reverberation is a continuing of the loud sound filling in the quiet immediately preceding it. If the quiet, you know, further away, the, the reverberation would die down again. So STI score. Um, for a church, for for com communicating complex messages, we'd want an STI of uh, maybe 0.6 or better. Uh, paging, you know, game or something like that, we could we could get by with a little bit less, maybe 0.5. So that's that's just a basic introduction, and you can look up more about the, the scale of intelligibility. Uh, it's called STI. Reverberation time, time alone is not the only metric needed. Room volume also comes into play in determining reverberant level and interference to intelligibility. And I give an example sometimes. We're used to talking about RT60 times and you know reverb times. Two seconds, is that long or is it short? Is it a problem or isn't it? Well, if you have two seconds of reverberation in a boardroom, it's a big problem. If you have two seconds of reverberation in a 500 seat house of worship, well, that's about right. That's nice, good enough to sing in, so forth. If you have two seconds of reverberation in in a large arena, that's a very dead room. Uh, so time alone, you need to consider room volume. And I say that to say that this is sort of qualified by, by I'm referring here to a medium-sized house of worship, you know, 200, 500 seats, something like that. If the RT60 is a second and a half or less, there will not be reverberation-related intelligibility issues. If the RT60 is a second and a half to two and a half seconds, uh, not a problem, but you need to be a little more careful. Careful to cover the audience evenly not spill excess sound to the walls and ceiling. For longer RT than, than that, you really sort of ought to model it in a 3D program that you can evaluate uh, the intelligibility. For the full ease program, you could enter um, surface finishes, you know, what's on the walls, what's on the floor, what's on the ceiling, and estimate what the reverberation time will be, or you can if it's an existing room, you can actually measure it and, and force that number in. And uh, then you get a much better idea of whether intelligibility, you know, what your speaker design will, will be like, like in, in terms of intelligibility. Um, longer RT60 rooms may require a line array. We will typically reach for the Entesis FR line source columns whenever there's an intelligibility issue because it's we'll use it it's a, it's about the best we can do with with that type of room um, and it will it will almost always give good results additional intelligibility issues echoes uh, echoes can come from rear walls balcony fronts uh, current concave architectural features, anything curved inward. They can be dis difficult to assess off-site, and 
they're also very spotty. I mean, it, you can have an echo problem at one place in the room and you know, you move a few few feet in one direction and all of a sudden you don't hear that echo anymore because it just focused sound at one spot. So they can be they can require 3D modeling to study or you know extensive time uh, on site with sound sources and, and measurement equipment and so forth. That's typically beyond the scope of services we offer. Almost always requires acoustic treatment solutions, although there are certain situations where you can uh, place a speaker such that it doesn't excite that echo or doesn't or or cast that echo in a direction where it doesn't matter like up in, up into the ceiling or something. Um, so with good information we can, but that that information is is very complex in terms of you know understanding the room acoustics. Uh, other effect issues uh, that affect intelligibility distortion. Obviously, if there's a gain structure or something's clipping, uh, makes it hard to understand. Frequency response problems. If you've got a blown uh, driver, a blown high frequency or mid frequency, you're not going to get those frequencies, and that makes intelligibility much more difficult. Noise, and this is this is an important one in a in a especially in a church setting. You've got a quiet uh, reverend audience, if you've got a noisy HVAC, you're going to have to turn the volume up just to get above it. And that turning the volume up can help, can get around it, but only to a certain extent, because beyond a certain level, turning the volume up actually reduces intelligibility again. So um, be sure to understand what, what noise might be in your environment that you have to uh, deal with. Will it feed back? Question number four. The answer is always yes. If the gain is turned up high enough, it will feed back. Somebody sells you a microphone that says we'll never feed back, it's broken. The real, the real question is, will it meet the customer's expectations regarding gain before feedback? Um, and that there's two pronged approach to this. Number one is to manage the customer, customer's expectations regarding talker level, reinforcement level, and microphone distance. If they want loud rock and roll sound, they're going to have to treat that microphone pretty much like a rock and roller does. Talk loudly into it from an inch or two away. Um, if they've got, if they've got a children's play and have you know, preschool children that can't talk very loud and are very shy and quiet, and they want to set a microphone six feet away, it's not going to work. It doesn't matter what your sound system does. Um, so that's, you know, you, if the customer doesn't have realistic expectations, you need to start by managing them. The second prong is, of course, designing for good gain before feedback. Uh, minimize direct sound spill into the platform uh, and microphone areas especially at mid and high frequencies. Low frequencies spill because speakers are typically, you know, approach omnidirectional at low frequencies. Uh, low frequency spill is unavoidable, but we can easily turn the, turn the bass tone control down a little bit if we have a high gain situation. Um, we can, the, 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 we typically do that anyway because of proximity effect of microphones. Uh, the other thing is to avoid reflecting surfaces right in front of the loudspeaker that can return energy to the platform. I had a church whose speaker was placed uh, just upstage of a lighting well, and the lighting well was, of course, lined in drywall and reflective materials. And so half the output of this loudspeaker went right into the lighting well and reflected right back down onto the stage. Yeah, the speaker was had problems that needed to be replaced anyway, but until that happened, I gave them much better gain before feedback by just putting some sound, sound absorbing material in that light well. Uh, so, you know, be careful about what's immediately in front of the loudspeaker that can reflect energy back to the platform. What about stereo, stereo PA? 
Some people say you can't do stereo PA. Some people say you can. Well, each channel needs to cover the entire audience area. And again, as evenly as possible. Um, we don't want half the audience to hear the right channel and half the audience to hear the left channel. Uh, we must maintain no more than 20 milliseconds arrival time difference between adjacent channels for any audience seat. Uh, that's because if we have longer uh, time different arrival time difference, we're going to start to hear echoes and it's going to affect intelligibility for any source that we put into both channels simultaneously. This limits the width and it also favors uh, higher loudspeaker trim heights because as you as you move up, your left to right doesn't change the uh, the time difference between the speakers as quickly. Two channel stereo will not produce a phantom sound center image unless you're standing right in the center aisle, but it can still be useful. It can add spaciousness and it can be relatively inexpensive in a narrow room. And I'll show that show you that in a minute. Three channel stereo, left, center, right. Um, We've actually been listening to that, to a form of that for decades in movie theaters. The dialogue is always in the center. The sound effects and the music are panned left and right. Um, so in a three channel stereo system, the firm, you have a firm center image and you can optimize the center speaker for speech clarity. You can use more spacious, musically optimized left and right speakers. It will have significantly higher cost, including a console with LCR panning. Uh, in the days of analog, that was a complex circuit had to be added in each channel, and it was it was basically only available in the high-end consoles. Uh, today, with digital, it's just a matter of a little bit of programming, and and it we have a good selection of LCR two LCR panning consoles. Um, available in digital format. Three channel can, re can be used in a wider room without violating the above time level differences because we're never putting the same thing in the left and the right. It's either left center and center right. Um, so we got that 20 millisecond gap from left to center and another one from center to right gives us a little more width we can work with. Building types, how does the building type affect the sound system? Well, let's go through a couple of common buildings here. The trad traditional shoebox shape, square, rectangular, um, can be covered from, if there's adequate height, can be covered from a single speaker overhead. We may need fills again for those front corners, um, or they can. you can put speakers left and right and actually be stereo. And here's what I meant about two-channel stereos can be not a lot more cost. Uh, here we've got a main speaker, and because of the the you know 90 degrees coverage speaker here can reach all the way across to, to the opposite side. So each speaker can cover that room because it's looking at it kind of diamond-shaped instead of square with the far front corners. So we can put two speakers here, and it's not much more cost than one main and two little fills here. We still need extra channel for the fills and so forth. We can we can sometimes do stereo at little little or no added cost. If that's a desired, you know, for the congregation, if they're heavily music oriented and, and would benefit from the spaciousness of stereo, that's an option. Uh, why? Fan or diamond room, square covered from the you know with the stage in the corner. Um, typically, we'll use an ex exploded cluster. This is uh, sometimes mistakenly referred to as LCR. It's not. There's a speaker on the left, a speaker in the center, a speaker on the right. But each one is covering that section of their audience. They're not not three channels of stereo. This is a mono system. All three speakers will get the same, essentially the same signal. Maybe delayed or or uh, you know whatever slightly slightly different but basically the same so stereo would be very difficult you'd need to cover you know all the way across from this side 
back across and it's, it becomes very difficult to do in stereo. Cruciform shaped churches. This would be a lot of your older uh, Lutheran and Catholic churches will be uh, shaped like this. They will have high ceilings, sometimes maybe a dome, uh, hard surfaces, a lot of marble, masonry. Um, so they're very reflective, very high, 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 high reverberation, and intelligibility can be a problem. So we'll often use emphasis columns uh, in the Catholic churches. Set them up like this, a pair covering the main, maybe some smaller ones covering the uh, the transept areas. Remember, you need to cover them as well. A long, narrow uh, building, we can put left and right on the sides. If, if In this case, we would have the height to do a center as well if we wanted. So either way, it could be done uh, left, right, stereo. Uh, probably need delayed fill for under the balcony and over the balcony in the back. This could also be covered from the center with a, like an IV6 uh, array it could be shaped to, to cover most of those rooms and maybe maybe not need some fills, depends on the, the distances and so forth. Other things you'll run into in churches, uh, office retail space reclamation. An old old shopping mall that is abandoned is is cheap space. It's got good uh, plenty of parking, uh, so it's often uh, young congregations like to like to use those spaces. And in many ways they're good, and in some ways they're bad. Uh, they often have limited ceiling height. They have posts in the middle, so that can be you know problem to get enough a clear clear space. Line arrays can be used to cover uh, sufficient distance from a low trim height. Point sources, if you use point sources, you may need um, delayed rings of speaker uh, just to, to cover a wide audience area. Conversion of a traditional church for contemporary worship. This can happen where a, a young service-minded congregation uh, picks up an old inner city church that might, you know, large traditional church. Acoustic space meant for choir and organ, too reverberant for contemporary music. Uh, the problem there is is getting the music, getting contemporary music to work in a building that's not favorable to it. Line arrays either a small emphasis or like an IV6, a, a, a modular line array, can provide good intelligibility. <clears throat> it may still have music clarity issues because just making that much noise in that, that space uh, can have clarity issues. Uh, but the stage is, is often more the problem. Acoustic drums, instrument amps, floor monitors can all over-energize the reverberant field. Uh, even before the house PA is turned on, you can have this noisy conundrum and uh, can't understand anything and you want to amplify it and, and only make it louder. So in that situation, uh, we would strongly recommend in-ear monitors, the silent stage uh, techniques, in-ear monitors, e-drums, modeled amplifiers, or if you need to use actual amplifiers, you can put them in a back room or in a in a box with some sound absorption material uh, to keep that sound energy from filling the room. So acoustic absorption is always the best option, but it's it's also one of the more expensive options. Worship styles in the sound system. Uh, traditional liturgical Christian church, music is the Catholic Lutheran, the music is usually acoustic piano, organ, maybe acoustic guitar, uh, very light instrumental uh, reinforcement. And that can be done through the main sound system or an alternate system. In that situation, the audience is generally very quiet, reverent, attentive. Uh, so high levels aren't necessarily needed. 
They can be speech only uh, and moderate levels are sufficient. The other end of the spectrum is contemporary Christian worship, which can be a full theatrical pro production, lights, smoke, the whole bit, rock and roll levels to 110 or more, which is too loud for any purpose. The vast majority of churches fall somewhere in between that. Uh, in what they call we call blended blended worship. Sometimes they'll have maybe some hymns along with the contemporary music. Worship style is much less dependent on denomination than it was 40 years ago. When I got started in this business, you could look at the sign in front of the church and you had a pretty good idea what went on inside. Uh, today, that's not near as much the case. You can have, you know, contemporary worship in a Catholic church and and you, you need to find out what each individual each individual congregation is actually doing. So look at uh, take a quick look at a few of the other faiths, uh, Jewish synagogues. Of course, the Orthodox synagogues have the rabbinic prohibition against electronic amplification on Sabbath and high holy days. So they're going to be speech and vocal singing only delivered acoustically they may need a sound system may want a sound system for use on other days for other uses of the room and that you need to you know clarify what exactly that will be uh reformed jewish tradition the synagogues are much uh they use speech and, and instrumental vocal music the building styles and the program requirements are very similar to evangelical christian churches Mosques, the Muslim faith, they typically will use a large open square or rectangular space. Again, mostly masonry uh, or hard surfaces, so it's very reverberant. Their worship style is speech only. Um, interesting tidbit, the audience plane should be set in your model to two and a half feet. They're sitting on the floor. They're not sitting on chairs or pews. So if you're you know using a line array with a very tight pattern you'll want to know where those ears are they're at two and a half feet not at four feet uh, they will have a separate women's section typically uh, sometimes it'll be in a back balcony sometimes it'll just be behind a curtain on the main floor um, you'll often not always but often need a separate uh, speaker system for for that area uh, emphasis columns again are a good choice in reverberant rooms uh, fr arrays two to three units tall for larger rooms and this is 200 columns for smaller rooms or for fills this particular room shown in this model here is the, the grand mosque of kuwait um, We used we used a three unit high emphasis FR and an emphasis 200 212 I believe to fill the back. Let me just show you a picture of that. Let this sink in. This picture was taken from the dome under the center. Uh, so there's just as much out the other way and there's just as much out the left and right as well. This is the front wall to the ceiling is 55 feet high. This room covers three football fields, 10,000 people. These little squares on the carpet are their equivalent of a kneeling pad, I think. So each one of them would represent where one person kneels. There's 10,000 people in this room. It's just incredible. So I highlighted out our loudspeaker system. This is a three unit high emphasis FR column. That uh, that column alone is 11 feet. Here you see, see a close up of it. There's another one like it on this side, and I believe there are additional columns uh, further left and right to to fill in the corners as well. Uh, this is a modern Reformed Jewish synagogue. Again, except for stars of David instead of crosses, you might not think this is much different than. A Methodist or a Presbyterian church. It's it's very similar 
uh, worship style entrance columns on the wall again because this was a reverberant room. And I, I want to point out one detail here is barrel ceiling. This got this continuous curve front to back. Now it does have steps in their beams or whatever. Um, I believe this center speaker was an old sound system that was proved to not be successful. And it's because it's on the center line. When you have this curved ceiling and a flat floor beneath it, you'll have a reflection between it. The sound bounces off the floor, spreads out as it's going up, it hits the ceiling and concentrates back down to the center of the floor again. So my rule is never put anything audio on the center line of a room that has a barrel ceiling like this. Don't put the speakers there, put them left and right. Uh, don't put the mix console in the center. Don't put, if you can avoid it, don't put the microphone in the center. That's a battle you may not win. If they've got a pulpit or an ear-worn mic, they can walk around across that center line. Um, but try to avoid it uh, as much as possible for any audio uh, uses. Glen Rose Baptist Church. Um, this is a church, modern contemporary church. It looks very much like a high school auditorium uh, to me. So it's very similar uh, type of sound system. This is a five unit IV6 arrays left and right and a small center fill to pick up the very center of the of the seating where they're too far off axis from the arrays. West Jacksonville Baptist Church. Then this is one I designed. Um, there's a three unit white IV6 hidden right up here, hidden in plain sight. We like when you can do that right above the screen on each side. And again, this is a stereo system by, by putting speakers left and right, kind of aiming them a little across, across the center. We're able to pick up, because these front seats don't go far out to the corner, we're able to pick up the entire room from each cluster. So this is a very effective uh, stereo system. Here we've got the the uh, choir seating at front, and we've got some uh, point source box speakers filling the choir in. St. Nicholas Church. This is a Catholic church. Right here you see the two unit entrances FR tucked into the brown wooden post. That speaker is all the way up here hidden in plain sight, and you missed, as we went by, there's another single FR unit, a delay fill right here, hidden in plain sight. We like when we can do that. Uh, they disappear into, this, into the architecture very nicely. Here's another one in among the beams, um, two unit FR. This one we use, we added a subwoofer to the Entesis. FR is only good down to about 200 hertz. It's just the nature of it's, it's, it's six three and a half inch woofers uh, in a very small cubic volume. So it can't produce below 200 Hertz, which if it's speech only in a reverberant room, that's okay. If there use any kind of music playback at all, you might want to warm up the bass a little bit. In this case, we have a VLF 208 dual eight inch subwoofer. Uh, tucked in alongside it as well. Shepherd of the Hills, San Antonio, Texas. Again, Antis's column tucked in among the, the uh, structural posts. Here we have a 206 over here pointed out to the side that's filling in the transept areas off to the side uh, in this, this is a cruciform shaped church. Don't forget the stage monitors. We have little MX 10s, 10 inch coax. Uh, they're available in, they were available in white. I don't have a nice picture of them in black. Uh, they're no longer available and discontinued in white, but uh, they can also be wall mounted. We have a bracket for that as well. And that's the end of my presentation. But if you have more specific questions, you can ask, email us. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.